We spent a lot of time on Galileo, and we're going to give Sir Isaac Newton, who was really a lot more important in many ways, just a few minutes. How can I justify this? Well, Galileo was more fun, his experiments are easier to show in class, and we're running out of time. What you're about to see is not an especially exciting or funny video, but it does cover the highlights of Newton's career and makes a few points that I want to follow up on. So as you watch, think about first the relationship between science and math in the scientific revolution. Second, the relationship between science and religion in Newton's life and in the life of other people who were leaders in the scientific revolution. And finally, third, the relationship between the laws of science and the laws of society or of a nation. Copernicus, Galileo, and some big names we haven't even talked about, such as Kepler, uh, all made great strides in observing the way forces of nature on Earth and in the sky worked. They observed, uh, they developed and improved tools for studying nature, including telescopes and navigation instruments that made travel across the Pacific Ocean practical for the first time. But what they really couldn't do was explain why a lot of what they observed or a lot of what their experiments uh, delivered actually worked. Why is this happening? And at the risk of really oversimplifying and making my friends over in the science department want to come after me with machetes, Newton's first big discovery or one of his big discoveries, the one that tied it all together was, what do you think? Okay, I haven't even seen the movie, and I'm not going to say much more about this incredibly important discovery, except to say that gravity turned out to be the force that kept us from falling off a spinning Earth, and kept Earth from spinning away from or into the sun, and therefore answered a lot of the skeptics about the scientific revolutionaries. I guess, however, it didn't work for this guy. So here's another really important topic that I'm going to let your science teachers explain. But I will say that Newton's famous three laws of motion gave inventors the knowledge they needed to invent powerful new machines. Stay tuned for the Industrial Revolution. But above all, Newton came up with a language that made sense of his laws and made it possible to carry them further. And that language was... Calculus. I used to be able to speak it, sort of, but I'm not going to try to do that. Now I'm going to leave this one to the folks down the hall as well. So I've talked about the critically important relationship between science and math, which Newton cemented, and Einstein, by the way, took in scary and wonderful new directions. The second thing I asked you to think about was the relationship between science and religion during the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. Now, most of our scientific revolutionaries were devout Christians. Copernicus was a priest. Galileo was sitting in church waiting for mass when he made his pendulum discovery. Now, you know, I'm sure, that Galileo later got into trouble with the church, mostly, in fact, because he backed the wrong side in a church squabble, which is a long story I don't have time for now, unfortunately. But take a look at this famous statement by Galileo about faith. I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with senses, reason, and intellect, in other words, the God who gave me the power to do what I do, to be Galileo-like, has intended us to forego their use, that is, the use of those talents, and use some other means to give us knowledge of the universe. In other words, uh, if God had not intended us to pursue the world with reason, why did he give us that gift which separates us from the animals? And here are some quotations about religion from Newton and at the bottom from Einstein. So to Newton, as you can see, discovering that the universe obeyed mathematical rules was proof not disproof of the existence of God. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. In other words, only God could have set this in motion, as he says in the previous quote. Um, 
Einstein, who was a Jew, resisted people who tried to label him as an atheist, although he was not a conventional believer. I've included just one of his quotes. Every scientist becomes convinced that the laws of nature manifest the existence of a spirit vastly superior to that of man. Now, that's not a ringing endorsement of the existence of God, but it's certainly not a suggestion that science explains everything. And with that, I'm going to leave Newton behind and move into a different branch of science, political science. In the late 17th and 18th centuries, all educated people read Newton or read about Newton. Voltaire, for example, uh, wrote a famous book on Newton that spread his ideas to people who didn't happen to speak calculus. Remember, too, that Europe was coming out of a great age of religious and civil wars, huge body counts all around. Enlightenment thinkers who looked at all this murder and mayhem got to wondering if there wasn't some better way to run society and to run government. The thinkers who read Newton or read about Newton, which meant all of them, or at least all of them after Newton had written, wondered if there might be laws that govern politics as well as the sun, moon, and stars. Maybe laws that would help kings and government officials do a better job. Okay, we know this guy already, right? He actually lived about the same time as Copernicus and also in Italian city-states. So, what does this statement by Machiavelli have to do with the scientific method? Well, if you think about it, Machiavelli is telling us to look around, to observe, to use our scientific method terms. Don't just ask what the world should be like. Ask what it's really like, and using that information, develop a hypothesis, if you will, about how a ruler can build a strong country in this real world and test it against history. Remember all those examples from history? In other words, Machiavelli was all about making observations, drawing conclusions, and you could even say that his advice was a kind of experiment. Try this, prince, and see if it works. So does anyone remember what was going on in England when Thomas Hobbes was writing this book, Leviathan, by the way? Uh, it was it means a large monster. It was the term used for the whale that Jonah, uh, that swallowed Jonah in the Bible. So he was writing from 1642, what was happening, excuse me, from 1642 to 1651 at the height of Hobbes' career. Well, it was also the height of the English Civil War, and life in England was indeed poor nasty, brutish, and short. So, how is Hobbes' statement like Machiavelli's? Well, Hobbes is also looking at what he sees as the real world, but he takes it a step further and calls what he sees laws of nature. This is before Newton, by the way, but not before the scientific revolution was well underway. Uh, so, in the state of nature, following nature's laws, without those laws, Men naturally just keep killing each other. So what does Hobbes think we should do about it? Basically, what does he say? The only way we can stay safe is by surrendering all of our rights, all of our freedoms to one man, the sovereign or king. And in return, the sovereign will keep us safe. Hobbes viewed this as the original social contract, the original deal that human beings made with their leaders. We trade our freedom, and in return, the leader, the sovereign, the king, protects us. So, what would you guess the kings thought about Hobbes' theory? If you said you thought they'd like this theory, you fell into the same trap that most of the seniors I've taught AP government used to fall into. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, kings tended to be either smarter or maybe meaner than Juan Diego senior, seniors. They hated Hobbes' idea. Why did they hate Hobbes' idea? Well, kings like Louis XIV or James I believed that God gave them the right to rule. Hobbes was saying that people gave them this right. Okay, way back in time with the original social contract back when people were living in the state of nature. But still, the implication, the idea underlying Hobbes's social contract is that the people freely surrendered their freedoms to the king in exchange for safety. Now, they gave them all up, and after that, the sovereign was in charge. Nevertheless, 
Who is in charge of the initial transaction? It's the people. This is a really dangerous idea for kings, even if this fellow Hobbes did think the kings had the right to be total dictators. What happens if philosophers, or even if worse, what happens if the king's subjects start thinking that they could change the terms of this contract? And just as kings fear it, along comes Enlightenment thinker John Locke. I've said that Hobbes was deeply influenced by the terrible bloodshed and the disorder and the chaos of the English Civil War. But Locke's model was the Glorious Revolution. Do you remember what happened during the Glorious Revolution? What made it glorious? Well, Parliament and the king and queen basically cut a deal. They entered into a kind of social contract. The king and queen would agree to follow certain basic rules that protected not just life, not just safety, but also liberty and property. In return, they got to rule as long as they kept the bargain. Locke was very influenced by Newton. They knew each other and they actually wrote letters back and forth. Locke simply thought that human nature and human institutions, like government, were also ruled by laws, and governments worked best when they obeyed these laws and protected basic liberties. And he guess what or who comes next? Well, I didn't put this fellow into my handout, but I'm hoping somebody recognizes the words. This is the preamble to the American Declaration of Independence, and who wrote that? Thomas Jefferson. But this part sounds an awful lot like John Locke, doesn't it? Self-evident truths is enlightenment speak for natural law. Okay, Jefferson substitutes pursuit of happiness for protection of property, but it's basically the same idea. Government does not have unlimited rights to stand in the way of people's personal goods or personal decisions, and if government breaks its part of the social contract, well, the people have a right to change their governments. And this is the point when the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment move out of the laboratory, move out of the library, and move into the streets and into the battlefield. Stay tuned for the Age of Revolution and our final unit before Christmas break.